Iowa's. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very overrated. Oh, my heart. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And with that, we'll roll the intro. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. All right. (laughs) Okay. And we're back. So. Um, I feel like I should get out the uh, the opening out of the way here. Um, you're watching the Portholes podcast uh, brought to you on the Bering Strait Network. Uh, we are also sponsored by the United States Naval Institute. Use code PORTHOLES on the website for 25% off your next purchase. And with that out of the way, Iowa's overrated. Oh, well, first off, okay. So a Facebook page, mm-hmm. which claims to like warships, um, posted a thing where it says, what's the most overrated, um, like warship or class or whatever in World War II. Okay. 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 So th- th- this was a real thing. Um, uh, people, of course, I'm, I'm reading through the comments, reading through the comments, people are like Yamato, Bismarck, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. okay, whatever. The common theme seems to be battleships. Okay. Right? Now I wasn't the first person to say the Iowa class, hmm. right? But I, I, I'm like, I like to be different. So of course I'm like, Iowa class, you know? Um, and this isn't because I like to like ruffle your feathers or anything. <laughs> yeah. um, but in many ways, and, and I'm also not joking either. I, the Iowas are, are good ships in, in my opinion. I, I don't like, I'm not trying to speak poorly of them or anyone who served aboard them. Um, but I feel like because of what they are, their long careers, you know, they were never really tested in like a surface action, mm-hmm. like all that well. Um, as the decades go, the myth builds and builds and builds and builds and builds. And suddenly the Iowa class is now this, by the time you get to the 90s and their final decommissioning, they're like these giants that are invincible. And so... In the Facebook post, the guy comments back on on my mm-hmm. comment, and he's like, the, 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 the Iowa class were the biggest battleships with the biggest guns, or they were the heaviest. I'm like, dude, you are totally dented. Like, <laughs> none of that is true. I'm like, none of that is true. And, and I'm like, here's why. And then uh, the, you get into the typical Facebook argument, which I try to avoid, but it's like, I'm like, well, and then I link to your video about, you know, what the Navy didn't like about the Iowa's. Mm-hmm. Which is not a small list of things. Right. So, and then, and then that was completely discredited. <laughs> they can't discredit the great Ryan Szymanski. I'm, like, I'm like, it's Ryan Szymanski, you, you, you know. <laughs> anyway, so then I just, I just left the, um, I just left the thread alone because I'm like, I, I, I can't. Like, I'm, I'm losing brain cells just interacting here. Um, so that's, that's. And- and that's why I'm not a member of most of these Facebook pages. Right. I, I try not to be. It's just, I, it's, it's hard. Um, so that's, that, that's what I wanted to cover today. I wanted to get your take mm-hmm. on that question and my answer. So Iowa class overrated. I, I think you hit the crux of it when you said myth. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and also when you alluded to the myth forms as these ships get older and older Mm -hmm. during world war ii everybody had battleships some of those battleships were better at some things some of them worse at some things Uh, the united states had other classes of battleships Mm -hmm. and in some cases those classes were better or worse in certain regards Uh, so you never hear anyone during world war ii saying that the iowas are the best ships out there Mm -hmm. they are competitive sure and and they're on an equal footing and, and often a better footing than most of their contemporaries. But this myth of invincibility does not come out until there are no other battleships left. Mm-hmm. They've sort of, because they've survived that that's just, that's because that's what they are. They're the best. Mm-hmm. So they've survived. Now, as I, as I mentioned, a lot of people in the comments said like Bismarck and Yamato are mm-hmm. overrated. Mm-hmm. But are they like, can I, I know there's a lot of hype. OK, so like I get there's a lot of hype. A lot of people seem to be interested in the Axis ships. Mm-hmm. Right. You see that in movies and in video games and other things, 
you know, I got a, I got an office in this building full of German ship models. Okay. You like to complain. I, it's fine. <laughs> so, but are they really overrated? Because we know what happened to those ships, mm-hmm. right? They sailed out, they took a lot of fire and they all sank, you know? Um, I mean, could they be underrated? Uh, I I would definitely say, especially in Yamato's case and in American circles, mm-hmm. she is underrated. She has the best guns and the best armor of any battleship ever put to sea. And the, the simple fact that she is the largest by displacement, they put the most resources into that ship, gives her certain qualities above anybody else. Think about how many torpedoes and bombs that ship took. It would not have taken that many to sink any other battleship Mm -hmm. of any other class, Iowa class or Bismarck or Mm -hmm. anything else. So so despite the popular culture, Mm -hmm. in my mind, something like Yamato is relatively underrated. Mm -hmm. We don't give it enough credit for what it sustained during... Uh, you know, its final battle and that attack, which ultimately led it, you know, to its sinking. And certainly here in the United States, I, I'd be interested. Mm-hmm. Um, I've never spent any time in Japan, mm-hmm. but these ships evoke a national pride. Yeah, I mean, that, you know, that's the Kurei one, Museum. You know, uh, yeah, that's yeah. one of the things they were designed to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, Yamato is named for the nation itself. So, you know, it's, that's kind of the whole thing. Um, so, yeah, so I, I get it. Um, so then what about so do, would you mind going through the list of things that the Navy doesn't like about mm-hmm. off okay. the top of your head? Just get, like throw out some basic things that we can discuss that maybe the people at home, you know, if they haven't seen your uh, uh, original video on the New Jersey channel, which I, I can link to. Um, but you, let's 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 break that down. Yeah, so first off, keep in mind, it has been at least two years since we made that video. We've made a thousand, literally a thousand videos since mm-hmm. then. Um but some of the big things the Navy didn't like, um, the Iowa-class battleships have a very high length-to-beam ratio to mm-hmm. achieve their high speed. And that makes them less stable gunnery platforms and less stable living spaces than uh, normally they would be designed to be. So they're, they're too narrow. Exactly. What, and, and now let's remember, too, United States ships have to pass through the pan- the. United States naval vessels have to pass through the Panama Canal. Mm-hmm. So generally, you're limited by the width of the canal. Um, you really, unless you want to go around the bottom of South Africa to get <laughs> to the Pacific, or if you build the ship in the Pacific. But you know, we don't really there aren't too many. Most of the you know East Coast yards are handling that, and then still even today. Mm-hmm. Um, so you're you're width restricted. So ships are too long. And the mm-hmm. Navy had one priority with building the, the Iowa mm-hmm. class, and it wasn't to build a balanced battleship. Mm-hmm. It was to build the fastest class of battleships ever to complement the rest of the fleet, which was slower and, and more stable. Mm-hmm. So these ships were never supposed to operate alone like they ended up being mm-hmm. the last. They were supposed to operate as part of a battle line. Mm-hmm. Uh, so In pairs or... Like the Iowa operates, they, they operate in pairs or one or one Iowa with the like the other fast battleships or because I say the other fast battleships. Uh-huh. I mean, North Carolina and yeah. South Dakota are not Iowa fast. It, so It was always envisioned that um, the Iowas would operate probably in pairs in divisions mm-hmm. and that those divisions would be a part of a battle line mm-hmm. that had a standard speed of 27 knots and then a group of four ships, a fast wing mm-hmm. that could that had a higher speed that could then turn the engagement for tactical reasons. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the whole concept of the battle line and battleships as the center of the fleet goes away while these ships are under construction and then they exist way longer uh than they were planned to be. Mm-hmm. But um, if you look at them as they're supposed to be part of a battle line, their their design is perfectly fine. Mm-hmm. If you look at them as this needs to be a balanced design that can stand alone mm-hmm. in the post-world, uh, post-war world, world, then they, they don't achieve that. The biggest 
weakness of the ships besides their sea handling characteristics, mm -hmm. which is especially apparent when you compare them to, say, British battleships like Vanguard in the uh, that are designed to operate in the rougher North Atlantic mm -hmm. uh, that are shorter and wider and, and able to uh, operate better in heavy seas. Uh, the biggest issue is that narrowness puts your magazines very close to the outside of the ship, especially for turret one. And uh, so that makes them more vulnerable to torpedoes than the Navy would have liked. Uh, and the torpedo defense system of these ships was not tested before they were built. And after... Is it different? Does it, does it build upon the previous vessels or is it, or is the torpedo protection on an Iowa bespoke to that class? The South Dakota class that predates the Iowa's was a complete departure from previous. So uh, like it's different than North Carolina, but is, so then is Iowa similar to North Carolina or is, and, or are they all different? And then Iowa and has the same exact scheme as South Dakota, more okay. or less. There's a little bit of, of variance there. Uh, and the Navy needs ships fast because the war in Europe has started. So they double the number of South Dakotas they're building. They add 50% uh, more Iowas and they lay them all down and start working on them. And then the first South Dakota comes out and they finally get around to doing tests. And they're like, hmm, this torpedo defense scheme isn't as good as we would like it to be. And that's against contemporary American torpedoes. We don't even know yet that the Japanese torpedoes are better. Much better. Much harder hitting than imaginable. So... And you, you, we see evidence in that when North Carolina is mm -hmm. torpedoed, um, when she first gets out there, big hole gets blown in the side. Amazing. Um, and yeah, you see the the damage and the photos of that. And you're like, wow, that's that's pretty impressive. And it's Murphy's Law, too. Mm -hmm. The the weakest point of the ship mm -hmm. is right next to turret one. Mm -hmm. And that's where she gets torpedoed. American yeah. fast battleships take a single torpedo between the 10 completed ships and mm -hmm. guess where that torpedo hits? Mm -hmm. Right where they're weakest. They had to flood the magazine or the whole ship could have detonated and been lost. That's incredible. Yeah. So, okay, so we've talked about the torpedo protection mm -hmm. being, so, but you, you hit on something here. Iowa, the Iowa class is very similar to South Dakota. Mm -hmm. Is that, does that also hold up for the armor belt? Yes. So very, very similar there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and then isn't South Dakota's armor belt just sort of a derivative of North Carolina's? Uh, it's it's a pretty significant departure in okay. that North Carolina had an external belt for 14-inch shell fire, mm -hmm. and the South Dakota had an internal belt for standard 16-inch mm -hmm. shells. Uh, but then the Iowa class comes out with the super heavy shell. Mm -hmm. So the armor is not as effective you're supposed to armor your ship against your own size shells. Mm -hmm. And against a standard 16-inch shell, it's it's got a reasonable immunity zone. And you say standard, like the uh, the the older 16-inch shells. Mm -hmm. So is that, we're talking Mark VI gun, like South Dakota, or are we talking even older, like Colorado? Both, both. Mm -hmm. there, there is a standard... Mm -hmm. weight armor piercing shell that's mm -hmm. about 2100 pounds a little over a ton mm -hmm. and uh the u.s navy right about when the south dakotas and iowas are entering service develops a super heavy shell mm -hmm. that's 2700 pounds that can be fired out of the same 16 inch guns uh used in the same shell hoists essentially mm -hmm. stored in the same magazine spaces but because it's heavier it can do more damage of course and punch through more armor mm -hmm. Uh, so suddenly, this armor, which was designed to be proof against 16-inch shells, no longer is. With that being said, mm -hmm. obviously, the U.S. Navy did not know the specifications of the Amato-class ships. Um, we didn't know that they had 460-millimeter guns until after the war. Um, had Iowa and New Jersey gone up against Yamato at Leyte Gulf... Mm -hmm. It probably would have been very apparent very quickly after taking one or two of those shells to realize that the protection was not adequate. Of course, that def like, there are so many factors that play into that. So I I get it. Um, but do you think that would have? Do you think that like that weakness would have been as like immediately apparent 
Um, of course, a 16 inch shell hitting a superstructure, whether it's 18, 16, 14 inches, when it hits structural steel, you know, it's just big holes going to get blown into it regardless. But like an actual armor belt impact, do you think they would have seen that right away? Uh, I've always been under the opinion that World War II era battleships are eggshells swinging hammers at each other. Mm-hmm. And while the Iowas had good armor, mm-hmm. being hit by a Japanese 18 inch shell was going to ruin their day. It was going to hurt regardless. Being hit by a Japanese 16.1 inch shell from Nagato sure. would have mm-hmm. done serious damage and ruined their day. Um, and Yamato, despite her armor, getting hit by an American 16 inch shell mm-hmm. would have had a very bad day afterwards. Absolutely. Um, so I guess it's less about could the armor really withstand the shell and more about what the rest of the ship is about, or in this particular case, that battle just never happening. Yeah. You know? Oh, well. Yeah. Um, the, the Iowas were uh, still very survivable ships. Mm-hmm. They had strong frames. They, they weren't going to mm-hmm. warp or break. Um, they, they could take several hits from torpedoes or shells without sinking mm-hmm. outright um, in theory. There's always that golden BB, like what oh, took well, down Hood. Of, of course, right. If something mm-hmm. finds the perfect path uh, through the armor, you can't armor your whole ship. Mm-hmm. But I, I do think that projectiles had outpaced armor design by World War II. It's kind of like um, like heavy tanks mm-hmm. in World War II. You know, eventually, how much is enough you know you have you know german king tigers you know and you know they have like cruiser level armor you know in some places and and so the idea is okay well i have to stop every possible munition fired and then you have this departure from that where it's like at this point shells have gotten so good Mm -hmm. to where i could have this 200 ton tank and it wouldn't make a difference so then just put no armor on it (laughs) yeah shell passes right through okay i don't care you know um yep so that, that's an that's an interesting that's an interesting concept. Um, what about the bow and its lack of reserve buoyancy? Um, yeah, that's, that's another issue, and it goes hand in hand with the torpedo defense. The the length of these ships again. Uh, there there is a math formula mm-hmm. that says that to get the highest speed out of your ship, it has mm-hmm. to be something like 8.6, blah, 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 uh, length to beam ratio. And the Americans knew that they wanted to build a ship 108 feet wide to fit through the 110-foot Panama Canal. Mm -hmm. So that meant it had to have an 860-foot waterline length. Mm -hmm. Uh, So they really stretched the ship, and you see that with the Mm -hmm. bow of this vessel. Uh, And so not only is it a really high length to beam ratio, but the bow gets very, very narrow. And so there's... Very little depth for compartmentalization in mm-hmm. there, and there's. Well, you look at it; it's it's very thin. I mean, it's very hard to subdivide. You think mm-hmm. a torpedo hits on doesn't matter to the side if you the explosion can easily pass, you know, from one side to the next. You know, when you actually get out all the way out there and stand there, you realize uh, there, there's not a whole <laughs> lot here. You know, and I'm not even talking about the the most forward part either. Yeah, you know, like it really. You know, it really narrows in front of turret turret one. Yep, like you like you discussed earlier. Yeah, yeah. So there, there's not much buoyancy there. If you get some uh, serious flooding at the back of the ship, she's just going to sit down. There, there's nothing to pump out of the forward part to raise that back up, um, and it's it's really narrow. So there's vibration at high speed, and uh, I believe Richard Landgraf said that when he was working at the Long Beach Navy Shipyard. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's aware of three of the four Iowas having cracks on one of their forwardmost structural bulkheads. Oh, good. Mm-hmm. Where the uh, and, and this is of course in the '80s when these ships have well exceeded their expected lifespan when they were being built in the '40s. Sure. But um, where this this thinner plate is grafted onto the front to get that artificial length mm-hmm. and, and give the ship a really good hydrodynamic efficiency, Mm -hmm. uh, but where that's bolted to the actual structural strong part of the ship is a, is a weak point, a known weak point. Hmm. Um, What about other factors? So you talked about the length Mm -hmm. and that leads to this slab side. Mm 
mm-hmm. this very flat mm-hmm. side. Because if you look at Bismarck top down, mm-hmm. this is very nice oval egg shape where the bow and stern are very similar and mm-hmm. how they sort of taper. Um, and then almost like right at the center line is this perfect where it flares out yep. and then it immediately starts to curve back. You look down on an Iowa or even I, I got picture. I got a Des Moines right here. Mm-hmm. Real flat the size of the ships are, you know, and they, it goes for a long time. Um, does that have any sort of issue? Um, it, I mean, obviously it prevents a flat target, mm-hmm. which is a problem. Um, is there any issues with that um, just from a slab side? The Navy actually really liked the slab side mm-hmm. because it made it easier for two ships to sail next to each other and do underwear replenishment and other things like this. Mm-hmm. And the American Navy is designed to operate at sea, resupplying at sea and, and uh, projecting power that way, whereas the German Navy is not. Uh, so in that respect, the Navy liked having flat sides on the vertical plane and they liked having long flat stretch on the horizontal plane as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's more hydrodynamically efficient to have a wider um, and, and even squared off stern on the ship. Mm-hmm. So the Navy didn't particularly hate that, although I will say a top view of the Bismarck is a, a much more aesthetically pleasing look. Well, you mentioned the squared off stern. Mm-hmm. Some navies, Royal, mm-hmm. uh, took that literally, mm-hmm. where they have literally the stern comes and stops mm-hmm. that it's like a flat plate on the back, which... I always thought was very goofy until I realized that that actually, in fact, works. It's more hydrodynamically yeah. efficient. It, it looks uglier than sin, but it's yeah. it's better because the water comes down the side of the ship and it mm-hmm. thinks it's going to continue on that route. And then it immediately has to curve. Then it curves in to fill the void behind the ship. And that pushes and the that ship pers- a little bit. The 180 then pushes on the back of the yep. ship. I don't know. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Crazy. Well, and you you see that on some American cruisers. They start to get pretty square. Like some of the Baltimores mm-hmm. and then Des Moines and Worcester. And they, they, there's some curvature there, mm-hmm. but it is very like, yeah, it's very, very flat. And then, of course, that's how you get the flat and deep. And then that's how you get the aircraft hangar back there, too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so what about the internal armor belt on on the Iowa? So here's here's the thing. I'm always going to be in favor of an external belt. Yep. Um, I think that a if a shell impacts the side of your ship, it hits your external belt. If the shell has no chance of doing damage, mm-hmm. like if it's, let's say, a five-inch shell shot at your battleship, uh, it hits the side, it either bounces off or it cracks or it does or explodes or whatever, and it leaves a nice scratch on your paint, and that's it. Mm-hmm. Um, an internal belt... Uh, Okay, it's that five inch shell is not insignificant and it punctures the outer layer of structural steel. Mm -hmm. Maybe it doesn't even get that far. Maybe it goes through the first layer, maybe through the second. Like the exterior are tanks, right? Yes. And some void spaces Mm -hmm. on an Iowa. But now you still have a hole. Yep. Like there's still a hole there on the side of your ship. And let's just say hypothetically it's above the waterline and there was nothing in this void space. Well, congratulations, you're fine, but you still have a hole in your side of your ship. If it happens below the waterline, okay, well now you have a void space that's now full of water and that's doing X number of things. Um, Or if it was full of fuel or something else, well now that's leaked out and you have to then- Or it's contaminated by water leaking in, yeah. Exactly, so now you can't use that. and you got a counter flood because now you're starting mm-hmm. to list. And and then there's the danger of the inrushing water as the ship is moving, peeling the steel away, making the hole bigger, putting pressure on the bulkhead. Yeah. Just any number of things. Mm-hmm. So in my opinion, um, having the external armor belt, uh, North Carolina, what would have been Montana. Yep. Um, of course, Yamato, Bismarck, external. Um, in my mind, that just seems like even if the belt is exactly the same thickness, having it on the outside of the ship where a shell hits it, cracks, breaks, whatever, bounces, um, that just to me seems like the best design. So why why did we why did we go from North Carolina to then internal belts? So you know, th- you know 
the the Navy absolutely preferred external belts, and when restrictions are removed, you you get the Montana design with an external belt, and for exactly the reasons that you mentioned. However, they had to accept the internal belt with just South Dakota and Iowa. Those are the only two American battleships with that, uh, because it was the only way to sufficiently protect them against their own size shells. The outer skin, an inch and a quarter thick on the South Dakotas, an inch and a half thick on the Iowas, the, the outer shell plating was just thick enough to decap an incoming armor-piercing shell so that it no longer had its armor penetrating cap when it hits the armored belt. Mm -hmm. If Iowa's 12.1 inch belt or South Dakota's 12.2 inch belt is on the outside, the the cap on the AP shell just pushes right through. Yes, and probably penetrates. And then let's say you've put the inch and a quarter, inch and a half plate behind Mm -hmm. that, the shell can continue to tumble and and go through that. Mm -hmm. Um, But putting the belt behind the decapping plate means that the belt will probably defeat that armor piercing shell if it doesn't mm-hmm. overmatch the armor mm-hmm. um of course this is all at various ranges of engagement which they figure out mm-hmm. um as you said before battleships especially by world war ii period are what'd you say eggshells swinging hammers at each other yep and this i think is very very obvious um when admiral lee in washington fights uh karishima mm-hmm. Uh, you have a World War I basic design mm-hmm. of British battle cruiser <laughs> um, that is sold to Japan as a Congo class battleship, mm-hmm. which, of course, um, you know, if, if it's the largest capital ship that you have, you know, we'll, we'll call it a battleship. Of course, the Japanese have, you know, they develop their own stuff. Congos are reclassified as sort of secondary units, battle cruisers. Again, they're then attached to the nighttime division. The, that's how they find themselves up right. against that. Um, Washington engages Karishima at basically point blank range for battleships, mm-hmm. like not literally point blank range, but at such a range where your barrels are pretty much the shell. The shell arc is so flat that the shell is is impacting at almost a perfect 90 degree angle. Um, it's not plunging in. Um and having to hit armor belts at weird angles or Mm -hmm. hit the deck or do anything like that. Um, Obviously, as we know, Washington is perfectly able to, to penetrate Karishima's, you know, older, I mean, World War one battle cruiser level of protection. Yeah. Nine inch armored belt versus 16 inch shell. We know how this turns out. Right. What's interesting, though, is that the the couple hits that Karishima then gives back to South Dakota that's behind or in front of, I can't remember. Mm-hmm. Um, and I believe, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but one of those shells punches through South Dakota's armor belt uh, around turret three in the back and enters the sort of space where the barbette is. And then instead of like, punching through the barbette or doing anything crazy. It kind of glances off the barbette, embeds itself into the floor and then explodes, Mm -hmm. you know, which Mm -hmm. is bad, but it could have been worse. I believe that shell hit just above the armored deck going through uh, the bulkhead and second deck. Mm -hmm. And then, like you said, it hits a 17 inch barbette, 14 inch Mm -hmm. shell against 17 inches of armor. Mm -hmm. That is not enough. So it deflects into the six inch deck and can't go through there either. Right. Okay. So, I, but so okay, so the, the point still stands though that at that kind of range, I don't mm-hmm. think Karishima's or a Congo's fourteen-inch guns should have no issue. At, at that kind of range, at that kind of trajectory, I really don't. Maybe they don't get through the barbette, but I think main belt at that kind of range, at that kind of angle, is uh, on either. Maybe not so much Washington, but South Dakota. What do you think about about that? Because remember, we've talked about Washington and North Carolina being yeah. an external belt. Um, what do you think about that? Well, really, once you get below five miles, you're in what's called knife fighting range. Mm-hmm. And uh, at that point, your armor doesn't count for anything anymore. Um, mm-hmm. The projectile should be able to punch through most armor like Swiss cheese. And we see uh, American cruisers 
eight inch guns, being able to fire through uh, Hie's armor mm-hmm. the night before mm-hmm. or two nights before, whatever, whatever the case was. Um, so at, at these really close ranges, smaller shells can punch through thicker armor. Mm-hmm. Whereas my, my rough rule of thumb usually is one inch of armor will stop one inch of projectile. Mm-hmm. Um, so had Karishima been able to land hits first, she would have probably put holes in, well, she did put holes in South Dakota mm-hmm. and knocked South Dakota out of action. She could have probably put holes in uh, Washington and, and knocked Washington out of action, but she doesn't. Washington gets the first hits, mm-hmm. and Karishima never responds. No. Uh, I was I had given this some thought. I had a conversation with someone else and about this particular topic, and, uh, and you actually brought it back up when you just said about um, – eight inch shell fire mm-hmm. doing damage to Hiei. Um, Admiral Lee, when, when he's looking through his binoculars as shells are going downrange to Karishima mm-hmm. and blowing little bits and pieces of, you know, off of it. Um, he only counts the shell. Remember this is at night. Mm-hmm. He only counts the shell impacts that he can see. Mm-hmm. Now that might be a successful now in, um, or, in his mind, he recalls like successful penetrations. So mm-hmm. he can see, obviously, like probably an initial impact uh, at night. You're probably seeing like a flash as, you know, shell you know hits steel. And mm-hmm. if a shell then continues into the ship and let's just say just continues into the bowels, you're not really going to see that. Right. Right. And then you've got a time delay mm-hmm. before it explodes, and you may not even see the explosion. And yeah. then, but let's say if it does explode, mm-hmm. you know, do you you could probably see maybe out the hole if you're looking at it. Maybe depending on where it goes in the ship, maybe there's a flag, you know, some residual flash out the out the hole. Maybe. Um, I just wonder how many at that range, given the armor of Karishima, I wonder how many shells punched through and then didn't actually detonate or just went through altogether hmm. and just over penetrated. Um, that's probably possible at the bow and the stern amidships. Mm-hmm. Um, There's probably enough material there. To, yeah. It would, the, the fuse would definitely go off. The whole point is, is that he recounts a certain amount of hits mm-hmm. And then later on, once they find the wreck, the thing is just riddled full of <laughs> sixteen-inch holes. And they're like, well, "You actually did a lot better, Admiral." You know, of course, that by then, of course, uh, Admiral Lee had passed away. Um, it's key. Lee is a very humble person, mm-hmm. so you know he's not exaggerating. In fact, he's probably downplaying it. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's not surprising to me at all that you would find that he did significantly better than he reported. Exactly. So, okay, well, we've gotten a little bit off uh, (laughs) topic here. Us? Never. Uh, Never. Um, So, in that, so if you swapped out Washington for New Jersey in that exact engagement, Mm -hmm. I would expect the same result. Mm -hmm. Uh, If you swapped South Dakota for New Jersey, you'd probably get the same result there, too. Mm -hmm. Uh, If she takes hits first, there's a good chance she's disabled before she can return in a meaningful way. Mm -hmm. If she puts the hits on first, forget about it. Mm -hmm. Give give her five minutes of of hot gunnery and and that enemy ship ceases to exist. Now, we just had a conversation um, as of filming this. uh, We just had a conversation about Alaska. Mm -hmm. Uh, Swap Washington for Alaska. Okay. So now you're, you've, same hits, mm-hmm. let's just say, but you've now gone from a 16-inch shell to a 12-inch shell. Uh, maybe the shell doesn't penetrate. I mean, that's a very good 12-inch gun, as mm-hmm. we discussed. Maybe the shell doesn't penetrate as far into the ship. Hmm. But I'm guessing you have less. If any, if any of Washington shells did, in fact, over-penetrate or if shell fuses didn't detonate, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm probably would not be the case on a 12 inch shell or even an eight inch shell for that matter. You really, your, your penetration power is a lot less, but you probably would do more localized damage to the various compartments that you did ha- actually hit. 
Yeah, the the American 12 inch super heavy shell would definitely overmatch Kirishima's armor, especially at, at this range. Mm-hmm. Uh, what was it like four thousand yards, like two miles? Yeah, yeah, for, point blank. <laughs> he punches through that no problem, and and you're right, it probably does detonate earlier. Maybe Lee counts more hits. Mm-hmm. Also, thinking about this some more, uh, I suspect a lot of the hits that Lee does not count. Mm-hmm strike the surface of the water short of the ship, but continue on their trajectory underwater and punch through the armor there. And these might even show up on the wreck as having hit the above water part of the ship. Mm -hmm. Because after a couple of these hits, she starts to roll over towards Mm -hmm. Washington. And now the shells are striking the water Mm -hmm. and going into what would be the belt. But Mm -hmm. Lee can't see that. He Mm -hmm. might even see splashes and register. Oh, we fired nine shells and I'm able to count nine splashes so we didn't hit anything with that salvo well no those, those shells have so much mass they kept going mm-hmm. through the water through the armor through the ship so back to back to the iowas oh yeah we were talking about them we were we? i think maybe i don't know uh so we've talked about the deficiencies mm-hmm. in the armor uh and then this goes back to the overall question of are they overrated mm-hmm um, so as the gentleman in the original comment section on the Facebook post said, you know, these things are ultimately invincible, you know, they're the heaviest, you know, mm-hmm. um, that's simply, obviously that's obviously it's not true just from being factual, but, uh, they definitely have their weaknesses, um, that were never tested. Mm-hmm. Uh, what about Illinois and Kentucky though? They had some modifications over the original design that we know about and some that we speculate about. Mm -hmm. Uh, They did do some upgrades to the um, uh, torpedo protection in that there were some stiffening braces that Mm -hmm. were originally in there at an angle. Mm -hmm. Well, that angle isn't as strong at Mm -hmm. stopping a... uh, an explosion as if it was at a right angle. Mm -hmm. And so that, that gets corrected in Illinois and Kentucky. And also, um, it is reported that they go to an all welded construction, which is both stronger by this point and is going to save roughly 10% of the weight by removing rivets. That said, you look at construction photos of Kentucky in particular, that was pretty far along Mm -hmm. and you can still see rivets. So obviously it's not a full, uh, like there are rivets in some places. Mm-hmm. Like I, there, I, when you go through a battleship uh, internally, there mm-hmm. are certain spaces where you can see the riveting. Mm-hmm. And is that just because like of expansion? Like if, if the plate was welded mm-hmm. in that particular spot, because of the flex on the hull, mm-hmm. that might p- potentially crack. Especially um, early World War II when welding is this brand new thing that we're just not that sure about. Mm -hmm. So by having a riveted plate, Mm -hmm. it does allow for some expansion and some movement between the plate. Obviously not a whole lot, but it, so I could see that maybe internally there would be some places where rivets would still be present. Um, I just think when, what about on the uh, exterior? What about, are there any rivets on New Jersey, like above the waterline anywhere? especially by the stern or by the bow? Uh, as you go to the stern and the bow, that's pretty heavily welded. Mm-hmm. Um, amidships, on the, above the waterline, on the decks and other places, you see a lot of uh, riveted gusset plates and things like that. So that's probably... So no external riveted, rivets for sure if, on Illinois and Kentucky. If, if they mean all welded, probably or no. It's tough to say mm-hmm. uh, what... They mean by that. We have taken it to mean that, oh, there, there's just no rivets anymore. It's all welded. And that means that they're going to save 5,000 tons of weight, if, mm. assuming that 10% uh, thing. But, yeah, and the, the pictures are very much of the ship under construction. So it's in the, like, skin of the ship in the torpedo defense where you can see it. I haven't looked at pictures of, say, Kentucky's completed hull close mm. enough to see if there's any welds or mm-hmm. or if there's any rivets showing or if it's all welds. Mm-hmm. Is there anything else uh, getting back to the original mm-hmm. list that you were, that you were going through? Uh, what else does the Navy not like about? Well, they were those? almost certainly going to 
change the superstructure configurations uh, on the like IO completely, like or like a, like a like a, a it, revise it pretty heavily, or we just don't know how heavily it would have been. Mm -hmm. um, many speculations. Well, the the, the IO's their their bridges were modified significantly, mm -hmm. uh, even over the construction of the first four ships. Um, we know from things like the Fargo class compared to the Cleveland class mm -hmm. or the uh, Oregon City class compared to mm -hmm. the Baltimore class that the Navy is going towards trunking two funnels into one mm -hmm. to give you better anti-aircraft arcs of fire. Mm -hmm. So that likely would have happened to Illinois and Kentucky who had not been completed up above the armored deck at this point uh, and are being built at the same time when these other modifications are being made to other contemporary ships. So you, you talk about um, the late war ships. So you have like the Oregon City Baltimore's, mm -hmm. which then ultimately evolved to the Des Moines class mm -hmm. of heavy cruisers. Which also retains the single funnel. Exactly. Um, when you look at those, they have a super firing, super, super firing uh, secondary battery, yep. like a mount um, behind turret two. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, you can say it right there. Yeah. Um, I know in some of the plans where, so because you have to trunk two funnels together, mm -hmm. well, w w you know where funnel one is and funnel two is, and if they have to meet in the middle, that's a lot of sort of real estate to pull, to pull back on. So does that, that shifts the whole superstructure back, yeah. which oh. then potentially allows the space for that secondary mount. Exactly. To sit behind where the sort of armored conning tower is now, that gets moved back, and then a secondary um, gun mount goes there. Exactly. So you've created more centerline space, which really opens up your AA arcs of fire. If you can just go from having five guns on each side mm -hmm. to having four guns on each side and one on each end of the superstructure, well, now you've got six guns that can train on either side. And you go from two that can fire bow and stern to three can fire bow and stern. Mm -hmm. it, it's just better across the board. And uh, we do have some stories about Admiral King and Admiral Nimitz meeting up for lunch one day late in World War II. And I'm not sure there's much documentation to back this up. But allegedly they draw what a future aisle would look like on the back of a napkin. Mm -hmm. And it looks this the forward superstructure looks pretty much the same as it does in in the existing Iowas. It's just moved back. The five inch guns get rearranged and the trundles get funk, trunked together. Mm -hmm. Likely, if the ships are designed that late, you're going to see other anti aircraft upgrades as well. So I would expect um, the sort of the the newer dual purpose five inch fifty four that equips early late war or early Cold War era destroyers, like mm -hmm. the, um, you know, the five inch 54 with mm -hmm. sort of the rounded, uh, you know, turret mm -hmm. or, you know, yeah. enclosed mount, you know, with the, uh, the little, the fine, the, the, what, what, what is that? You know what I'm talking about, right? Where it's got the little dome. It, it's got a dome on yeah. top for the gun captain to stick his head out mm -hmm. like a little plexi bubble. So I would probably expect to see that mount. Um, Possibly. Mm -hmm. It's hard to say. Uh, you are seeing 5-inch 54s start to show up on Midway, on, on mm -hmm. ships like the Forest Sherman-class destroyers, and, mm -hmm. and others around this time period. The Montanas are redesigned to have this. Uh, but you also have ships like the Des Moines-class cruisers mm -hmm. uh, and the existing Iowa-class battleships that mm -hmm. have the 5-inch 38 still. Uh, really, I would expect to see changes in the lighter anti-aircraft armament. I, I could guarantee changes in those compared to yeah. the 5-inch yeah. 54, which is a, a maybe. We, we don't know. We yeah. don't have the plans. Well, I think you could swap out You could swap out the 5-inch 54 mount, um, the one I'm talking, not Montana's, but the, the later one mm -hmm. at probably like – this was done um, for that Atlanta alternative. So – yeah. Uh, so that basically the turret ring is smaller, so it matches the sort of current five inch thirty eight, whereas Montana's five inch fifty four turret was was too big. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that uh, that's the reason why I say that because they can be swapped basically for a one for one, uh, so you don't have to redesign, you know, reinvent the wheel um, on that. 
Uh, but then but I think you're right, though. Uh, 40 millimeter goes, you know, you get a bunch of three inch automatic guns, um, obviously radar and everything controlled. And the 20 millimeters might go away entirely. I'm a big fan of the Thunderbolt mounting and electrically driven quadruple barreled mm-hmm. uh, 20 millimeter that Massachusetts got one of and a couple others enter the fleet right at the end of the war. Um, so a U.S. flak veerling. Something like that. Something like that. Something like, a, hey, that kind of works for the Germans, kind of. You're, you're now mm-hmm. using the smaller round to put enough fire on a kamikaze or, mm-hmm. or a larger aircraft that you can chew it up and destroy it, which was the real issue was that we can shoot planes down with the 20 millimeter and the 40 millimeter, mm. but we're not stopping them entirely. That plane is still continuing on its trajectory and hitting our ships and doing damage. Just need to shred, turn it into scrap. Exactly. That was, um, well, along those same lines, that's how you end up with Des Moines and Worcester. Um, all those ships, all those post-war cruisers are just for that very reason. We have to get all these ships have to carry all these guns because even the Des Moines, those, those guns are dual purpose. Mm-hmm. They use a very specific anti-aircraft shotgun shell, which destroys the barrel. <laughs> so they're almost immediately discontinued. But even if you look at uh, Worcester, you know, it's a six inch, you know, automatic gun that's designed for specifically for shooting down aircraft. Um, obviously it's dual purpose, but its main role of course is to, uh, is to, defend the fleet against kamikazes yep. as you know the invasion force happens um so I, I wouldn't be surprised then to see a lot of those 1945 six seven eight weapons make it aboard illinois and kentucky and have a very des moines worcester looking iowa class ship for sure i i think that would have been uh something that the navy really really liked mm-hmm. and um as the war transitions into a single ocean war, maybe you would also see uh, six foot deep torpedo blisters added to both sides of these ships <laughs> oh. <laughs> to yeah. add to the both torpedo oh. protection and give them a little another layer of steel for a projectile to oh, come no. through. So they end up like bloated, like all those awful Pearl Harbor survivors. Yeah, oh. and, and their speed will probably drop to 30 knots. But it corrects a lot of the survivability issues. Yeah, I guess. Okay. Ugh. Ugh. Uh, okay, well, fine. F- fair enough. Uh, do you think that Iowa or New Jersey would be around today if Illinois or Kentucky were completed? Ooh. So my, I'm going to say no. Mm-hmm. So hypothetically, if all if four Iowas, doesn't matter which ones, are retained, the first two being the oldest and because when they're ordered in batches of two, mm-hmm. each one builds upon the last. Right. Um, which, again, which is why Illinois and Kentucky would be the best out of the six. Mm-hmm. Um, so if they're going to obviously, in my mind, they would retain the newest and most advanced. So we would get Illinois and Kentucky. And then they would keep Missouri because, well, you know, uh, what happens in 1945. And then Wisconsin's also newer, so... That's hard to say. The Essex-class carriers that are still around today... Are are the oldest. Are the oldest (laughs) because they were the ones that needed to be modernized. To be refitted. So they got the work and then the Navy decided, well, that's too expensive. We're not going to refit the newer ones that are in better shape. So um, that's an interesting point. Let's um, say in 1958, Iowa and Wisconsin are the ones that have been the most heavily upgraded. Mm-hmm. And Missouri is the least heavily upgraded. Mm-hmm. Uh, with but given, given the surrender, mm-hmm. that ship never, they would, uh, there would be political unrest. Like there'd be no way they would ever let that ship be broken up. I don't think the Navy cared cared about uh, well not not specifically what you're talking about, but cared mm-hmm. about how many ships there were. They mm-hmm. had three Des Moines, so they saved mm-hmm. three Des Moines. Um, they had four Iowas, so they saved four Iowas, even though they only brought one back during Vietnam. Mm-hmm. Um, 
I think if they had five Iowas, if they had six Iowas. They would have saved six Iowas. They're, they're all the same equipment. They're all the same design. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you make a design to modernize one, even if you're only going to bring one back, well, it's real easy to modernize those other ones. Mm-hmm. And in the meantime, you can strip parts off of those other ships held in reserve to feed the beast that's still there. Uh, Lexington operating into the 1990s, an Essex-class aircraft carrier. I think I read somewhere that three other Essexes were held in the mothball fleet mm-hmm. just to strip the parts mm-hmm. to keep Lexington going. So I don't think necessarily just because they had four Iowas that they would get rid of two Iowas. Uh, okay. But maybe they would take in, – in the uh, – Late 90s, early 2000s, they decide they only need two Iowas in reserve, so they choose the two most historically significant, Missouri and New Jersey, Mm -hmm. to turn into museums. Mm -hmm. So maybe they choose to get rid of the most historically significant and keep the other ones, which Mm -hmm. also happens to be the ones that are most modernized Mm -hmm. in the 50s, Iowa, Wisconsin, Mm -hmm. Illinois, and Kentucky. Do you think... So along those same lines, do you think any of them get scrapped? I mean, uh, two out of three Des Moines get scrapped. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, so do you think that they then cut loose a couple of the Iowas then versus, you know, versus all four becoming museums? So we, we keep yeah. four, you know, all four become museums or it's we have we keep six, four still become museums two get scrapped. The museum ships that are saved are not necessarily the most important. They're the ones that are available when a city or other mm-hmm. uh, entity is attempting to get a museum ship. Mm-hmm. And it's more often than not, the organi- organizations that form specifically to bring back X ship mm-hmm. fail. But organizations that form to get a ship in their town uh, succeed. So the question really then becomes in that time period from the 90s to like the 2010s, where would two other Iowas go? That's an outstanding question. Mm -hmm. And really, Iowa and Wisconsin are saved. Um, It's one thing if a home state saves their battleship, like Texas saving Texas. Mm -hmm. Um, Illinois and Kentucky can't save their battleships. You can't get a 38-foot draft Iowa-class battleship up to (laughs) those states. Mm -hmm. Um, So it has to be something like Los Angeles is looking for Mm -hmm. a battleship or uh, Norfolk is looking for a battleship. Hawaii, Los Angeles, those are, you know, and uh, obviously San Diego has got Midway. Mm -hmm. Uh, Yeah, I mean, Norfolk, uh, yeah, obviously got Wisconsin, um, you know, you all on the Delaware have New Jersey. Mm-hmm. You're, running, you're running. I mean, New York, yeah, but the, they have but intrepid, you know. I, the East Coast, uh, basically, every four hours you hit another capital ship. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, or sometimes yeah, every two hours. North Carolina is just right below uh, Wisconsin in reality, you know. And then, of course, then Charleston. <laughs> yeah, so, like, one area that maybe – has room uh would, Georgia there you go. yeah like Georgia or Texas like yeah. you've, you've got what is it Kings Bay Georgia and then mm-hmm. uh Mayport Texas are both mm-hmm. Navy towns Jacksonville yeah. uh, of course is is a big tourist destination mm-hmm. so maybe there's room there maybe mm-hmm. uh really these ships are saved because they're deemed significant because they're from World War II and they're the yeah. last World War II ships left mm-hmm. to save. Uh, If Illinois and Kentucky are completed but do not have any legitimate World War II service, I think that it would still be Iowa and Wisconsin that are chosen to be saved as museums. And then those two are go the way of Des Moines and Newport News, Uh which, again, no World War II service there. Which is funny because, you know, we sit here and talk like Kentucky wasn't scrapped. It's like that full hull was towed away and scrapped just like it would have been had it been finished. So exactly, you know, who knows, especially um, what we were just saying, though, once you get to Massachusetts Mm -hmm. and like Massachusetts, you know, Battleship Cove and Fall River, you wouldn't put a battleship in Maine like 
the winter just gets and I, you have problems I mean, yeah. even in new jersey having to close and mm-hmm. you know, it's hard to heat and everything else it's you know, the, the climate doesn't really permit putting a museum ship that far north because then it then it just becomes yeah i i would admit that uh, new jersey is one of the um least good looking museum ships from the outside mm-hmm. uh maybe the least good looking battleship from the outside. And it's not because we don't do work on her. It's because we can't do work on her three months out of the year. I would also argue that we are the best or the second best looking museum battleship on the inside mm-hmm. because we're forced to work inside for mm-hmm. close to half a year. If it's colder than 50 degrees, you, you can't put the paint down. <laughs> it, it just doesn't stick. Oh, you could probably talk for hours on, <laughs> on that. Yeah. So, so de- I would, I would not go any further right. north than, than Battleship Cove, for sure. Yeah. Um, is there anything else that maybe you wanted to add about what the Navy didn't like? Uh, of course, you know, you can also go back and watch the video from two years ago that Ryan and company did. Um, you know, the New Jersey channel's the the best site for that. Uh, and I can't think of anything else that, we, that mm-hmm. uh, the Navy didn't like, but I think we should talk about... Mm-hmm. Uh, the invincibility myth. Yeah. It was probably intentionally put out there. As a propaganda piece. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Uh, Both by the faction that is constantly fighting over this time period to bring battleships back. Mm -hmm. And once the decision is made to bring these ships back, Mm -hmm. well, now we want to terrify the Soviet Union about Mm -hmm. these ships' capabilities. Mm Mm-hmm. One modern submarine launch torpedo exploding under these ships. Game over. Yeah, game over. A Kirov-class battle cruiser able, able to shoot missiles from mm-hmm. 500 or 1,000 miles away. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're not going to sink an Iowa, but you'll mission kill her before she gets within mm-hmm. range of shooting at you. Like These ships are still vulnerable in the 80s, even though they are very survivable under most circumstances. But... We spent all these money to bring them back. We might as well tell the Soviet Union to just give up. They can't compete anymore. Mm-hmm. Hey, did it work? <laughs> I'd argue that it worked. Maybe. We'll see. Huh. Hopefully. Fingers crossed. Uh, anyway, um, so I think we're gonna, I'm going to end this one here because we, we, we could probably go on for a long time. Um, again, I'll link to the, the video, to your video um, down below. Um and then also, just quick in closing, remember, code portholes, USNI website. Uh, pick yourself up a, uh, a copy of uh, U.S. battleships or U.S. cruisers if you want to uh, read for yourself, um, you know, maybe what the Navy did and did not like about the ships. You can check out the specifications, see the differences between the different hulls. Um, and, yeah, so uh, thanks, Ryan, and uh, I'll see you on the, uh, on the next one.